Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Carlos Perez, welcoming you to Nova Southeastern University. We've got a, a special program today on children's mental health and psychology. We're going to talk a little bit about behavior modification, really focusing a bit of, uh, on the careers and um, how we work together. Um, so I've got a, a wonderful panel today. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, some self-introductions. Um, again, my name is Dr. Carlos Perez, and I'm Director of Outreach for the College of Psychology at NSU, Nova Southeastern University. And one, uh, one of our alums and uh, professional in the field, uh, leader in the field, Donna Berghauser. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Donna Berghauser. I am a proud inaugural alumna of NSU's um, School Psychology program. I'm really excited to be here this afternoon to speak with you about the field of school psychology, my experiences in them, and to hopefully inspire you to want to consider a track as well. Um, I'm currently a Florida licensed and a nationally certified school psychologist that is working in the public schools here in Florida. I'm also an adjunct professor for NOVA's school psychology program, and I am a past president of the Florida Association of School Psychologists. So thank you for joining all of us. Thank you, Dr. Amy Morales. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Emmy Morales. I am a behavior analyst. Um, a bit of a fun fact about me, I was actually NSU's youngest graduate in 2013. Um, so yes, I actually looked that up yesterday. <laughs> I was. So I've kind of come full circle and that I am now lead faculty of the Graduate um, Applied Behavior Analysis or ABA concentrations at NSU. And I'm also the program administrator for our child life specialists and our ABA concentrations as well. I'm happy to be here and hopefully talk to you all a little bit more about the field of behavior analysis. It's an exciting one. Dr. Annie Morrow. Hi, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and I work at South Florida Integrative Medicine, a private practice in Coral Gables. I also teach as an adjunct faculty member in the Department of Counseling. And I, oh, my, and my other fun fact is that I uh, relatively recently finished my postdoc, my postdoctoral fellowship at the Mailman Siegel Center at Nova Southeastern. So I'm an alum and also um, still teaching a little bit. So I, I like um, Dr. Morales was saying, I'm really looking forward to talking more about, um, about psychology, careers, and, and all of that. And Dr. Anna Owens. Yes, hello, my name is Dr. Anna Owens. I am <clears throat> in the Department of Counseling. I have a little bit of a unique role because I'm split. So I do half clinical mental health and half school counseling. Um, and I have experience in both of those areas. I have been a school counselor in, in Palm Beach County for about five years. Um, and then I do private practice in Boca Raton. Um, mainly working with children and, and teens and their families. So that's really a passion of mine. Um, and sort of um, creating that access to school-based mental health. So a lot of the, the teens that I work with, um, you know, their, their problems that they're, that they're dealing with on the school side. So I've been fortunate to kind of marry those two things together. I can't imagine how the kids are doing this year. This is a, so we, we could talk a little bit more about that. For sure. Stella, Dr. Sarah Valley Gray. Hey. Yes. So I've been around for a while. As I was listening to everybody's story, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm an alumnus too. Uh, so I graduated from the clinical psych program. I have a background in clinical, but my professional life has been in school psych. So I led the development of our specialist and doc programs. I'm currently the director of the doc program, and I also direct our continuing education program here at Nova. So thank you for asking me and us to be here today, Carlos. Uh, great. So uh, Donna, tell us a little bit about what you're doing and what's going on with the field of school psychology these days. Well, as you can imagine, there is a lot going on. Um, just trying to support students and really teachers and families as we navigate the challenges of the global pandemic. 
um, while also trying to help students transition from e-learning back into the brick and mortar school systems. Um, in addition to trying to get them focused on schoolwork while knowing that there are so many other things weighing on their minds at this time. Um, so as I mentioned before, I am a practicing school psychologist. I'm actually in my school office here. Um, I work in a Title I middle school. So in addition to COVID, there are a lot of other challenges that my unique school population faces. Um, there's a lot of trauma in terms of community-based tra trauma, generational trauma, um, within the families. And so really trying to implement um, trauma-informed practices within the school setting. So as you know, we know through research that those factors can negatively impact not only a child's development, but their ability to achieve their full potential in the schools. Um, so it's really awesome to be able to have a position where you're not only providing direct mental health services to the students and linking the families um, to community-based resources, but also having the opportunity to shift mindsets of the teachers and faculty administrators um, to really widen their understanding of mental health. Oftentimes we want to just talk about specific diagnoses and individual cases and individual experiences, but truly mental health and well being is such a global term. Um, when we're talking about, um, you know, effective behavior and classroom management, when we're talking about just creating self a safe and welcoming school environments, um, those are all things that then can grow positive mental health in a school setting and they don't get talked about enough because again we want to focus on the individuals. So I love that my role as a school psychologist truly allows me to be a systems change agent. It's one of my favorite, favorite terms um, to really just justify that the work I do is not just one-on-one, -on -one. it's truly to impact the school community as a whole, whether it's here on our campus or in the homes of the students. Um, And that's what happens when we're live. So. <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> I'm back. Okay, sorry yeah. about that. You were um, doing so well. <laughs> I know, I didn't want to stop the flow. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. sorry, am I back? You're you back, but you're not moving. You're frozen, but we can hear I know, sorry about that picture. It always catches you in a terrible phase, right? But that's okay. <laughs> Um, and I guess just the last thing I wanted to mention to you is just being able to reconceptualize um, education as a whole, right? When we we're talking about being social justice change agents as well and addressing inequities in education, um, it's something that I'm very, very passionate about. Um, I love that 2020 has really opened the dialogue, um, not just for adults, but truly for students. It's been astonishing the number of students who have felt comfortable enough to come forward to talk about the experiences that they've had, the racial perceptions that they hope that they hone in on, um, and really just allowing students to have the opportunity to talk about that and be direct agents and making the changes that they hope to see at their campus as well. So I'm really looking forward to talking all about that, but there's so many other people, so I'm gonna pass the mic. <laughs> hey, you know, when, you, when you're saying that, I, I really think that there's, there's such a need for healing out there. And I've seen uh, so many kids and families having a really bad year and uh, I'm hoping maybe we could touch a little bit on that. Um, Dr. Emmy Morales. Hi. Um, so as I mentioned before, my career in behavior analysis really started at NSU as an undergraduate student. Um, and then I went off to Columbia and I completed my master's and doctoral degrees there in behavior analysis and the application of behavior analysis to schooling and yet nothing really prepared me. And I, I think everyone can agree with what we're going through today. Um, here we have these, these clients or these students who we wanna work on social skills, but you can't actually touch anyone anymore or you need to be sure that you're, you're socially distanced. So it has opened our field to a lot of things that we really didn't consider before. 
Um, and it has forced us to, to be creative in, in the way in which we try and shape and, and build these behaviors. Um, so while I am more on the side of educating and training future analysts, um, I do have a private practice, so I do get to keep my toes wet um, in the field and just helping parents and parent training is huge. It's always been part of what it is that we do because at the end of the day, even as a school teacher, so I was a behavior analytics school teacher as well. Even as a school teacher, there are only so many hours in the day that you actually spend with these students. Once they go home, they're with their parents or they're with their siblings. Um, so parent training has always been a large part of what we do, but especially now, where these kids are spending the majority of their time at home. Um, there's, they don't have that, that, that little release, right? Or relief um, where they have a play date or they have sports to go to, um, but they're spending that time at home. So it's a lot of my work now is focused on equipping the parents um, to, to help their child and, excuse me, how to ensure that we are still building these social skills, right? And how we're trying to um, be sure that these problem behaviors decrease. Um, and I think that for a while it was more so let's try and maintain the progress. But now that we see that this is, I think at first people thought, okay, we have a month, the two, maybe three months. And now we're at the end of 2020. I feel like it just flew by um, where it's like, no, we need to, this is a new normal for us, right? So we can't just remain stagnant. We can't just maintain um, um, their progress, but we have to continue progressing. Um, so the field of behavior analysis in, has really evolved um, in trying to, to use telehealth services and to be sure that we're still able to take data. Data is huge. It's a big part of what we do. Um, we like to say data or it didn't happen, right? If you don't have the data to support what you're saying you did, um, then it didn't actually happen. And so that's been quite a challenge, just ensuring that you're actually taking accurate data. And because we make all of our decisions based on this data, it becomes super important. And I think that parents have now, they have, I mean, they've always had multiple hats, right? But now they're behavior analysts, they're speech therapists, they're physical therapists. <laughs> I mean, you name it, that's what they have become. Um, and so there's there's a lot going on for the parents and there's a lot going on for the kids and just trying to be that source of support for them and to ensure that um, progress continues. Um, so while I am still involved and in, in most of my work is focused on training, equipping, um, building new teachers, new behavior analysts, um, a lot of it is centered on helping parents and helping families through this pandemic. Uh, Dr. Annie Morrow. Hi, everyone. I was listening to uh, different topics, you know, school psychology and behavioral um, treatment, behavior analysis. And I was trying to think about clinical psychology and how I see myself fitting into, you know, how am I similar? How am I different in my training and my background? And so I, I think overall, I really see clinical psychology. And I have a PhD in clinical psychology. I know some of the other uh, speakers have a PsyD in clinical psychology, which is, they're two different things, um, as, as many of the attendees may know. Um, so I really see the training as focused on becoming experts in behavior change. And so really harnessing, you know, science to do the highest quality assessments that we can. And there's a lot of overlap with school psychology there. And I'm a very behaviorally focused psychologist, you know, as I, I co-trained um, in the Mailman Siegel Center, which has many behavior analysts. So there's a lot of assessment that is similar to school psychology and a lot of the treatments that I do that are similar to behavior analysis. I, I do think What's interesting, though, is that, you know, for example, I have a lot of experience with neurodevelopmental disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, autism, and I do work with adults as well. So I work with, you know, doing assessments for, you know, little babies, little toddlers that are 18 months old, all the way up to working with adults. And so for me, you know, sometimes individuals that need services are older. They're no longer at school anymore. So if you're 40 and you have autism, who's going to help you? So um, for me, I, that's definitely something that I um, have enjoyed getting to work on during the pandemic. And during this time, there's been a little bit of leniency where different states will allow providers to have a temporary waiver to practice across state lines. And so that's definitely an area where, for example, I have a client that 
is in another state that is an adult with a neurodevelopmental disorder and they were having difficulty finding a specialist in their area and so they they ultimately got linked up um, and i and i feel like that is one little silver lining to the pandemic is that um Without that, I can I, I describe it as that I can only help people whose feet are touching Florida soil. Um, so I, th there's so much that I could go on about um, in this area. And I think the thing that I wanted to end on is that I also really feel like I am really interested in wellness and well-being. And for me, a lot of the work that I do is about trying to understand people's values. It could be a parent's values or just an individual and their actions and really just trying to look for the overlap and when the their values, their, their core things that are so important to them and their behaviors, the things that they're doing every day are overlapped and aligning, I think that's really a place of well-being. Um, so I, I didn't get to go too much into all of the science, but I have not just worked a lot on this in, in terms of the clinical work that I do, but a lot of the research projects that I've worked on and that I continue to work on and present on are really in this realm of sort of the art and the science of, of behavior change. There, there really must be a tremendous amount of research that's going to follow uh, this whole period, I can't imagine, in all these fields. Uh, Dr. Anna Owens. Yeah, well, I don't know about you guys, but I have certainly enjoyed learning a little bit more about my colleagues and, and kind of what you guys are, are up to as well. Um, so as I mentioned, I, I'm in clinical mental health counseling and school counseling. So I, um, I'm constantly trying to get a pulse check. I like how Dr. Moreau said what her um, degree was in. So I have a PhD in counselor education and supervision. So, um, you know, my role at NSU really is more in teaching. So I am a full-time faculty in the, in the um, Department of Counseling and, um, you know, do a lot of mentorship. I recently took over um, the practicum coordinating placement position for the Tri-County, so Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach. So really kind of helping shape those practicum and internship students, um, their experiences, I've recently been reaching out and working with districts, um, you know, liaison that are school districts to really kind of see what's happening this school year because it has really just changed so quickly um, and, and is evolving, right? It is, it's continuing to change as the year unfolds. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's certain speculations about, you know, what January will look like and, and that it will more or less continue as it is, right? Where teachers are, um, you know, doing a blend flex or, you know, half virtual and then some students face to face. So um, certainly those challenges, um, you know, I really loved my time as being a school counselor. Um, but, you know, I, I knew that I, I wanted to kind of go into the role of teaching in, in higher education. So, um, you know, I, I'm grateful for that time because I believe that experience really gave me the know-how um, of working with children and their families, certainly understanding how um, individual schools really work and, and understand the dynamics and, and how those things function. Um, and then the clinical mental health side. So I really um, you know, now try to focus on creating that access to school-based mental health. Um, and I certainly understand that that does sort of have a trickle down effect. So we need to start with our local school districts um, making sure that we're advocating, creating those connections and relationships so that we can be um, uh, those agents of change and, and, and hopefully um, see some progressions moving forward. So. Great. And Dr. Sarah Valley Gray. Sure. Thank you. So I, you know, similar to Dr. Owens, I am a faculty member and I do a lot of faculty kinds of stuff, which is just not as interesting as what these other ladies are doing. Um, but one of the things that, um, that I do have the opportunity to do is to help prepare students who are in our specialist and doc programs to go out and do the very things that these ladies are describing. Um, you know, we have two programs, one that's a specialist degree, uh, which is midway between a master's and a doctorate. And that's really like the, the most common uh, degree that students obtain as they go into school psych. We also have a doc degree. Uh, both take about the same amount of years. 
And, you know, like it, it's heartwarming for me to hear the kinds of things our students are doing. Um, our students, you know, well, Donna is one of our students, Dr. Berghauser is one of our students who went out and is really making change in the Hillsborough County area. Um, we have students all across the country from our specialist and doc programs that do just about everything. Uh, and, you know, like as I hear about the various areas that um, we've been talking about, you know, I'm a little biased in that school psych, really, you have the opportunity to do just about any of the things that we've been describing. Um, you know, so working with families, working with kids, doing assessments, helping both at the individual and systems level in really making change. Um, so, and so Carlos, I have a question for you. Um, in terms of the audience and the sorts of things that would be useful, um, any thoughts about information that might be helpful? Uh, yeah, well, um, the uh, chat is open, so mm -hmm. we can definitely uh, uh, begin to receive questions and um, uh, anything that people want to go into. Um, but uh, I'm, I, I did want to prepare and, and kind of start off with a couple of questions that have already come in. One of the questions that really is, is, is my question, but I think it's, it's everyone's mind um, today because we, we, we've been hit by a trifecta of major issues and many others, economic as well. Um, what's the biggest challenge for kids today? I think it's so complex right now because many kids are not able to um, engage in education as we know it. You know, some kids are engaging in e-learning. And I can tell you at the graduate level, sustaining attention for more than about an hour is really challenging for adults. And I cannot imagine what it's like for kids. There was like a little picture of a kid who was sitting in his computer and um, they, they, he's like thrown over, <laughs> you know, his mom walked away and he just sort of laid down on his chair. You know, developmentally, being able to sit at a computer and not have those breaks, not have the opportunity to engage socially with other kids, not have the ability after school to go play baseball or whatever your choice in terms of extracurricular activity and the social piece, um, it has to be really stressful because all of us have been removed from our ability to sort of have a release, whether that's going to the gym or for some people it might be like religious kinds of things, whatever it is, we don't have the same ways to um, sort of sustain ourselves. And that's particularly challenging for kids. And so you have parents who are, are struggling both from a, a social and emotional perspective. It's really hard to be able to give to your kids if you don't have much to give because parents are trying to be teachers and all the things that we've talked about at the same time, trying to maintain employment and trying not to get COVID. So it's such a complex, complex time. Um, you know, there's gonna be a lot of healing after we finally get out of our homes. Yeah, I can echo that a little bit um, because I certainly have, you know, friends and colleagues that are teachers and parents and um, I would say one of the biggest challenges that that our young people are facing right now <clears throat> is just that social isolation and the lack of the, the social emotional connection um, with their peers, with their teachers, their mentors, their coaches. Um, and so, you know, I, I know some individuals that are in private school and they are back face to face. So, you know, there's there's certainly going to be some some inequalities and, and those things are going to continue to be present. Um, and, and like I, I mentioned, as this year unfolds, I think we are certainly going to really need to be addressing um, sort of the, the traumas that are going to go alongside us, right? Um, as far as reporting, um, you know, I, I even think of things which is just probably not the most important thing, but, you know, testing and test scores, it's like, are these things just going to go away? Or, you know, are we going to assume business as usual next school year? And so I think a lot of decisions are going to need to be made as well. So um, I, I was going to add to that, I really think about this, like Maslow's hierarchy, and that bottom you know, foundation of his hierarchy is safety. 
And this is something that keeps me up at night. I, I think this way, I know it's a little negative to be worried about this, but I, I do think it's a reality. I am worried for, um, for example, you know, from students all the way to graduate students that I, there's there are immigration concerns for international students that are enrolled in virtual classes. I know the universities have come up with workarounds for that, but this is something that people are worried about as you know, in terms of residency visas and all that, it's much more stressful right now in the pandemic when everything is closed. You know, child abuse, domestic violence, those rates are up, substance use is up. There are a lot of, you know, concerns that really do affect that day-to-day -day safety. I also have collaborated a lot with the special needs community over the years, and this has really hit special needs families so hard you know, the, mo the mothers that might be uh, missing out on work and, you know, other issues, again, really going back to safety. Um, uh, there's even for a typically developing child, like Dr. Valley Gray was mentioning um, and Dr. Owens was mentioning, it's hard to sit still. It's very difficult to be socially isolated. If you're nine years old and that's your chronological age, that's so nice, the number nine, but a developmental age sometimes is you know, seven years lower and they're, you know, maybe at that 24 month old level developmentally. And so now you might have these, and granted it's not huge percentages of the population, but it is a small and very important percent of the population where there are these big gaps in sort of their chronological age and their developmental age. And I have seen, I, I mean, a really alarming trend where you know, a child may have had an individualized education plan to have a one-to-one -one paraprofessional. And then now during the pandemic, they're getting almost nothing. And so what does that look like? And so these are, I mean, I, I think my mind just gets stuck on that bottom part of Maslow's hierarchy of, you know, a roof over your head, you know, safety. And, you know, I, I think too, partially because I've spent a lot of times working in traditionally underserved communities. Um, I just, I see, you know, healthcare, food insecurity, those are things that I'm really concerned about at the moment. Yeah, as, a, as a grown man, but having uh, immigrated to this country and having a very Latino name, um, I think I've been very hurt this year and in, in certain periods. And when I speak to uh, so my colleagues, friends, and, and uh, alumni students that are African-American and their kids have been hurt. What is going on with the kids? Do, are, they, are they suffering? Are they picking, how much are they picking up in the media? And, and if they are suffering, what can we do? Not to put you on the spot or anything. I think that when we talk about social justice, a lot of times people tend to tense up, right? Or, or clam up, or it's like, okay, here's this hot button topic, right? But it's almost like how we speak to our kids about bullying. You just have to do it. They're facing it. It's impacting them directly. So we have to have these honest conversations with our kids. What does that look like for a child who's atypically developing? Maybe that means a social story, right? Or maybe that means finding these concrete examples for them, walking them through it, giving them the language. But having these conversations are so very important as young as they, as, as young as they can understand. And a lot of times they understand a lot more than we give them credit for, right? Um, so it's simply about having that conversation. Um, you can't hide from it. <laughs> you certainly can't. It is everywhere. And even if you think you've built this lovely bubble or, or shelter, you haven't. These kids have access to social media. Um, they're friends. Even though it looks different, they're still able to plug in. And if they're not able to plug in, that's a whole other concern, right? Um, so it's, I, I always say to have the conversation and allow them to show you how you can help them. Yeah, if I can piggyback off that too, um, when I really think about how do you have those conversations, I think first and foremost, it's creating those environments where it's even safe for kids to have those conversations. 
just like you mentioned, Emmy, right? Like adults are uncomfortable having to talk about that and it shouldn't be the case, but kids can pick up on that. It's kind of the same thing. I know working in schools, sometimes it's harder to talk to the adults about supporting LGBTQ youth, for example, but when you open it up to the kids, it's like they're down with it. They're more comfortable with it than the adults are. They want to know how to help because whether they're an ally or they know friends that are there, like there's just so much that you can do. Um, so really for myself and at my school, what we've been honing in on are social emotional learning strategies. And so that's just building community in classrooms, it's building community in your school, um, creating a culture where people are accepted for their differences, where people are celebrated for the diversity. Um, and when you really allow and create that safe space for kids to have it, so it's not an argument, it's not a one race versus another, but it's genuinely like, here are some things that either I've experienced or I'm seeing, and here are some ideas on how I think I can be better. And when you allow the kids to say the problem and come up with their own ideas, they often blow me further away than the ideas that the adults at the table could come up with, because the kids, they're, they have it in them. But a lot of the times we try to talk over them, right? Because we're just saying, oh, they're just kids or what do they know? But sometimes they know better than us and we just have to allow their voices to shine brighter than ours. To piggyback on what you said, and I think this happens a lot. A lot of people are having the conversation and it kind of just stops there, right? Let's have this conversation and find out how we become part of the solution, right? There's a lot of talking going on. And sometimes, and honestly, I do feel like I'm representative of the race usually in conversations like this, right? Um, but it almost stops at the conversation and I wait. I, I tend to sit back and listen to everyone talk and talk and talk in circles. And I kind of wait for, for someone to, okay, what are we going to actually do about this? And even though they're kids and they're young, there are ways that they can make a difference. Um, and, and, and that regardless of, of whatever race you are, there are ways that you can make a difference because it directly impacts every single one of us. I agree. And thank you for the action planning note, because that is critical. Even as adults, think of how many professional organizations came out with statements in support of Black Lives Matter movements and different things, racial injustices, and we're all going to fight it. But where are we with that, right? And I know people are also looking sometimes at the election results and they're a little bit surprised because they can't, you know, however their philosophies align, but just the other half of America, like we're genuinely split right now. And it's just, how do we really move from, okay, we already know what the situation is, but just like you said, how can we move it forward and really let's do it. Let's find the people who are down to do it. And there are a lot of us out there. So uh, Penny, at any time you can pull from uh, the, questions that are com coming in. I'll, I'm going to pull one that is, uh, Lauren is a BCBA behavior analyst in Maryland, working in adult services. Very interesting. Uh, what do you coach parents, uh, natural support networks in, during a transition age? So this, well, I would assume they're receiving services. So we always try and push our clients towards independence, right? And I tell parents all the time that, okay, this is really cute. Johnny's four years old and he's doing this. But when Johnny's 18, it's not going to be cute anymore. So you have to always look towards the future. What do we want this to look like? What do we want Johnny's life to look like? And build, um, and, and I told my students as well, when you're writing a long-term objective or when you're writing short-term objectives, you have to have that long-term objective in mind. Um, so what to coach parents in is independence. How do you help foster independence for that individual? What does independence look like for, for that? specific um for that specific child well not a child client um and sometimes that means putting away what you thought your child's life would look like and accepting your child for where they are and figuring out how best to support them um and and it's it's always difficult once parents find out that their child has been diagnosed and it's it's a tough process um and it's, it's you're almost mourning expectations right um, but then as you learn your child for who he or she is, um, you, 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 you kind of shift your focus to helping your child best. So I always say with parent training is independence, um, having independence in mind and helping them help their child um, gain independence. I hope that answers the question. 
You know, I had a, a funny, uh, a fun question that came in or made me smile for some reason. Um, it, uh, it, is it normal for an, an 11 year old to be shy and grumpy? And it reminds me, there was this commercial about some a young lady was on a, um, was grumpy and then she was on a jet ski and suddenly she smiled and dad caught the picture and it was almost like she stopped smiling. And isn't this typical for a, a teenager or a, a, a preteen to be shy and grumpy? What do you think, Sight panel of experts? Uh, I can jump in really quick. Uh, I, you know, I think the the shy part is, you know, they're just still really unsure of themselves, and they're maybe lacking certain aspects of their self confidence, and they're learning their social surroundings, right, and how to integrate themselves within social settings. When I was a school counselor, I was um, in the secondary school, so middle and high school. And I just love being with the sixth graders. So that's really where I spent the majority of my time. And, and that would be an 11 year old. So the grumpy side, you know, I think that maybe comes maybe one or two years a little bit later, but certainly the shyness, um, I think those transition years, right? So if you're talking going into sixth grade or even going into ninth grade, um, developmentally, there's something that um, is, is usually, you know, they're, they're slow to, um, to sort of trust everything that's happening around them. So, um, but I always see them as, as very bright eyed and excited to be there usually, um, but sort of testing the waters, specifically at that sixth grade and ninth grade marker. Behavior analysis is very different as, <laughs> as the kids get older. Suddenly your bag of tricks they don't work anymore. Nobody wants a sticker. They don't care that you they, that you think they did a great job. Um, and sometimes it turns into okay, we can go play basketball. Like that's your reinforcer. Um, so it definitely gets a little trickier as they get older. There was a second part to that question too. Is it normal to be more negative than positive? I was going to add into I you know I think what Dr. Owens is mentioning and what Dr. Morales is mentioning is that. It's definitely normal as you know children grow up into being teenagers that there are differences in the way that they want to interact and what privileges they enjoy. I, I think one of the things that I see sometimes children and teenagers struggling with is like what I would say is very significant irritability. And so I, the way I think of irritability is if you're in a state where you're easily annoyed or you're easily made angry. And so, for example, if you're spending most of the day, every day for two weeks or longer in this state of being extremely grumpy, or, you know, if someone has three or four days in a row where they are extremely irritable or extremely grumpy and they're sleeping very few hours a night or their appetite is affected in either of these situations that I'm describing, I am going to be really concerned about that child's mood. Um, so I, I think there's definitely some you know, normative grumpiness that you expect as, as teenagers get older. But I've also seen, you know, when you look at the data, for example, on teenage depression in large longitudinal data sets, that most of the time the age of onset for depression is older than age 11. So what happens? Suddenly, all of a sudden, it pops up that, you know, everyone only gets to be a, dep a person that's struggling with depression after age 12 or 13. I don't know. I mean, I, I think there's some research that shows that irritability in children with ADHD predicts depression at later time points. And so, I, I mean, I've seen that there is growing science on looking at irritability and grumpiness. Um, temper tantrums is sort of another area where people will ask this question of what's a normative amount? What's a, a typical amount of temper tantrums for my four-year-old? And there are data sets that look at, you know, groups of children in different areas of the country, large groups of children and report back. And so I, I think there is a lot of science to support um, people working in children and adolescent mental health to be able to guide parents and so I think one of the questions that people will say is, oh, blah, 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 you're talking about all this. Like, so what would I do? 
Well, I think there are really good options out there. For example, a child's primary care provider, or as these lovely um, women often have worked in school settings, there are often a lot of resources that are available through the child's school. So if people are asking that question and it's about them or their family or someone in particular, I think it's helpful to ask the primary care provider or to ask a, a mental health professional affiliated with the child's school that question and they can let you know um, you know, a little bit more information about what the next steps might be. It could be like Dr. Owens was saying, oh, it's just every once in a while. And that's what sixth grade looks like, you know? Um, so to kind of piggyback to you about like the negative thinking and the positive, um, one of the recent practices I've started incorporating more in my school as well is utilizing a growth mindset. And so this is teaching children that skills and abilities, intelligence, anything can be developed with time and practice. And it's also helping them to reshape their mindsets of thinking that failures are the end all be all, right? It teaches children to, and adults, I have to practice growth mindset a lot too. It reminds us that failures are opportunities for learning, that mistakes are temporary and that you learn and you grow from them. And so I think incorporating mindsets like that with younger children and especially in middle school um, because they get so frustrated easily um, and really just helping them to understand that it's in them if they choose to nurture and foster that versus just continually having a negative mindset because it can be changed if you're open to it. Um, and then if you don't mind, I saw a question that I wanted to jump in on. Somebody had asked about standardized testing, and I think it was a Shayla um, asking about standardized testing and like regression for students and just how to support them. Um, so it's really interesting because I'm assuming we're kind of already thinking about students who have academic deficits, but regardless, we know that there are slides that are happening. To be honest, it's really difficult to gauge right now the level of instruction, engagement, everything that's happening in classrooms right now, whether you're in person or online. Um, so I know it's kind of cheesy to bring up the RTI model, but what I really think schools and um, administrators and teachers and everybody, families really need to consider is just having a strong tier one, right? So like, going back to those foundational academic skills. And if you need to remediate certain skills, that's important as well, but just really focusing and knowing what the kids are supposed to be learning and not make it crazy and complicated and adding in all this extra stuff, but let's kind of try to find the meat and potatoes of what we're, the kids are supposed to be doing. Um, but I think also we have to remind, remember um, to have grace and to also understand that while we have these high academic expectations for our students, like there is unfortunately a lot of forgetting about the humanity in education right now. And so while the focus is how much learning our kids are doing or what are we accomplishing in the classrooms, at the end of the day, academic growth can actually happen without even talking about academics. If children are environments where they feel comfortable, where they feel respected, where they feel connected with adults and individuals and each other, um, and I think that unfortunately, there's a lot of bureaucracy in education. And so there are all these mandates that are still out there. But at the end of the day, if you really just focus on the people and the person, those growth and gains are going to come back, even if it's after the pandemic. Um, but just in order to get there, it needs to be those relationships and the emphasis on relationship building between students, between their teachers, with families. Um, you know, I just I can't underscore that enough. And we have quite a few uh, direct questions on academic programs. Uh, a little bit later, I'll, I'll go into some detail for you. Uh, today was pretty much a general discussion, but a really interesting question that somebody brought up is um, transitioning from your different specialization areas. And some people are clinical psychologists, school psychologists, school counselors, mental health counselors. There's complexity there. And sometimes people want to work in different areas or there's there's a lot of teachers out there that are looking to add um, ABA. Uh, how do you how do you know where to go? So I think some of that is figuring out what specifically your goals are professionally. Um, you know, in order to work in a school setting, you have to have a certification to do that, and then to work in agencies within the community, you have to be licensed. Um, and I can let Dr. Morales speak about the ABA. But I think um, 
the first piece of that is to figure out, well, what am I trying to accomplish professionally? What is it that I want to achieve? Who do I want to impact in the world? And then based on that, um, you know, there's a variety of different careers available to meet those needs. Um, but it, I think it really has to come from what's driving you to make that change right now and who, like, what sort of things do you want to accomplish and what is it that you're not getting currently from your position and how do we get you there? I always tell um, individuals just looking for, for guidance that ABA belongs every and anywhere that behavior is and that's everywhere, right? Um, so especially now that the board has shifted towards allowing um, multi, multiple disciplines um, also obtain the BCBA or Board Certified Behavior Analyst credential, that it leaves room for um, other disciplines to be well-versed in ABA or to be behavior analysts. Um, so the first thing I say is to, one, just to echo what Dr. Valley Gray said, is to figure out what your goals are. What do you want um, your profession to look like? And sometimes it's not as clear and simple as you once thought it was. Um, and sometimes it is what you make it. I, um, a lot of times ABA, people just think of autism, right? And that's understandable because it's, it's known as the gold standard treatment um, for ASD. But ABA, I've seen horse trainers um, who are also behaviorist, dog trainers. Um, Weight Watchers has behavior analytic principles. That's my dog in the background there. Cute. Um, <laughs> Interestingly enough, she is not trained. Um, I know, so, my God, good. <laughs> I mean, she's house trained, but she came that way. So I didn't really do much behavior. She's, she's a special case. Um, she, uh, she had a very sad upbringing. But um, yes, so dog trainers, horse training, um, working in businesses, organizational behavior management. Um, so it's almost seeing how ABA, and I used to tell my undergraduate, I teach an undergraduate course in behavior modification. I asked them to challenge me and said, you tell me what career do you want to, to what, what is your future career? And challenge me to figure out how behavior analysis fits in there. Um, and it's it's always, it's been pretty cool. And sometimes they stump me, but I always come back around because it really does exist everywhere. So if you're looking for a change, one, I always say to observe, observe someone, speak to someone who's in the field. Um, and for the most part, I've had several, yeah, I've had several people reach out to me just saying, well, what is behavior analysis? What does a day in your life look like? Um, and I'm more than happy to have these conversations because your education, it's an investment. It's, it's very large investment. <laughs> so you want to be sure, but also give yourself room to figure out what you want to do. And a lot of that comes through internships or practicums, observations, volunteering, and things of that nature. So once you've done that, and you're kind of thinking, okay, I can see how behavior analysis fits in with my career, or I just want to be a behavior analyst, I always send them right to the board's website. Um, because People like me will tell you exactly what you need to do and will guide you through the process, but there's nothing better than actually going in and seeing the information and understanding the information on your own or for yourself. Uh, Dorothy asked, uh, one of you mentioned working with parents on how to handle children with behavioral issues. Can you, can you provide some? Sure. <laughs> um, so, and I do this with training graduate students as well. I ask when they, when people say, oh, my child just has, they list off all of the issues. I ask them, well, how often do you think that you're approving them? Um, and I was trained to deliver about four approvals per minute. And that seems very unnatural, right? At some point, I remember being a graduate student saying, I don't know what else to approve. <laughs> the child is sitting nicely, they have their hands folded, what else do I say? But we do that because we want you to get in the habit of finding the good things that your child is doing. It's almost like, going into the kitchen and using a recipe book to cook as opposed to just going in there and knowing exactly how to cook, right? So we want it to be automatic. And sometimes you don't even realize that you probably are pointing out a lot of the inappropriate things that your child might do. Um, and sometimes they really are doing, <laughs> um, um, engaging in a lot of inappropriate behavior and that's okay, we'll get there. But the at the very basic level, we want to be sure that they're, getting some type of attention for doing the right thing, no matter how big or how small. Um, if they put the milk back in the fridge, 
Um, it's interesting because I told my, my dad that I think that he was a behavior analyst. He just didn't realize. And oftentimes a lot of us do um, implement these tactics and, and principles. We just don't realize it's behavior analysis. And growing up, he said, well, you know what? You're going to start off the week with $5. I'm going to take a dollar away for everything that you do wrong. And needless to say, my brothers and I never got $5 because <laughs> someone always forgot to put the milk back in the fridge or whatever the case may be. Um, but there are these systems that you can set up. Um, one, teaching your child how to appropriately um, access your attention, right? Sometimes we get very busy, especially now that parents have multiple hats, um, that they might not be getting the attention that they need. And it's important to remember that attention, whether it's negative or positive, is still attention. Um, so whether or not you're yelling at Johnny for not putting away his, his laundry or you're telling him um, or you're giving him positive attention, it still functions as attention, right? And so as a behavior analyst, we try and determine, at least on the environment, what is maintaining your behavior or why are you doing what it is that you're doing? Um, and using that to implement an appropriate tactic. So I would say the first step um, would one, be sure to approve your child, catch them being good is the phrase, um, and show them ways in which they can appropriately gain your attention, whether that's a token economy um, or whether they can earn things throughout the day or perhaps at the end of the week, um, something that they might be able to work towards. And I think that behavior analysis gets a bad rap in terms of, well, you're bribing kids. It's not bribery. I mean, we all go to work and we expect a paycheck, right? Um, and there are certain um, our consequences shape our behavior. Um, so I would definitely tell parents to one, be sure that you are giving your children attention, that you are being intentional about calling out the good things that they do. And if you do need a tactic or a principle, you're trying to get your child to complete their homework or do Zoom school. The pre mac principle or grandma's law is a quick and easy one. Um, and that's first then. So first you do your homework, then you can play video games. If your child really doesn't like homework and you want to, um, to kind of condition that for them, then perhaps you only actually require them to do about a minute of homework at a time. And then they have access to their preferred activity. Um, that would require a lot of oversight from you because you would need to be manipulating how much time they're spending on each. But grandma's law, first this, then that. That's pretty quick and simple. Um, creating a schedule so that they're able to anticipate their day um, is very helpful, especially now that things kind of, I, I don't know, I feel like it's been February forever <laughs> um, and we're in November. So it's its all the days kind of seem to warp into each other now, but creating a schedule so that they can anticipate their day and maybe sometimes it's, okay, well, did you do everything you were supposed to do during this block? Awesome. You get a check mark or a star. At the end of the day, if you have eight out of your 10 stars, then you can have access to whatever the case may be. Um, so one, providing attention, knowing your child, and to try and put together these, these systems for them so that they can, act, they can have a little more control um, of their day and of what is expected of them. So we're getting pretty close to the, the hour. So if uh, I remind you if, you, if you find a question that you want to address, please do that. But uh, a question I always like to ask when I, I do these is, to tell, tell me about a favorite book or, um, or type it into the chat. So uh, either something that is entertaining or uh, something that's really uh, connected to the topic of children's mental health. Any suggestions? I stumped you with the book, huh? You have so many <laughs> or websites. There's a lot of uh, questions out there with uh, parents uh, with specific areas and careers. And I know well, you're looking at the questions too. I'll put a shameless plug in for the National Association of School Psychologists. It's naspconline.org. Um, they have a tremendous pl plethora of websites, resources, they come up with their own infographics. And there's so much information that's out there that is not just specific to school psychologists, it's for educators, it's for parents, it's for um, the teens and children themselves. Um, so just checking out and seeing what's available to them. I'd also recommend the other national associations for the respective fields that are um, here, their state, um, local, state, 
associations as well. I guess I should plug FAST since I did NASM too. Um, I'm trying to, I'm going to take a second and look over on my bookshelf to see what I've been grabbing most. Um, we'll throw some titles out. Yeah, and, and she mentioned FAST, but it's the Florida Association for School Psychologists. Mm -hmm. And you, you're bringing up a lot of great topics because there's so many online resources. And one of the things that's occurred is we've exploded with uh, things like Zoom, that there's so many uh, resources out there. It's a little overwhelming. That's becoming a new issue. <laughs> I was going to do something lazy and just pick up the book that was nearest to me. <laughs> so I like this book. I like the Treatment That Works series for other um, mental health providers that are out there. There are very science-based workbooks where this is one that focuses on cognitive behavior therapy for teenagers, but they have, this one is called the Unified Protocol for the Transdiagnostic Treatment of Emotional Disorders in Adolescents. It's a mouthful. Um, so I wanted to plug this series, the Treatment That Works one for um, professionals that are out there. I think it's a really um, helpful, really effective resource where I just see people setting goals and I, it's an honor to collaborate with people and watch them learn and grow and, and reach what they wanted to reach. Um, and then while we were going over resources, I wanted to do a, a shameless plug that I started a podcast a couple of weeks ago where I interviewed researchers, uh, experts and clinicians on um, some of their projects and sort of a little bit of clinical type of stuff, a story, something that they learned from observation or experience, and then a moment for them to talk about a, a clinical um, psychology type of project that they're working on um, or something that they read about and use all the time. So the name of the podcast is Queen Like Royalty and Behavior Change, like turning over a new leaf. So I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Any other questions or suggestions? And I've, we've had a few uh, links in the chat. Yeah, you know, I know we're giving kind of the, the national organizations and even state, but be sure to look at your, your local ones too. Um, even, you know, if you're a, a teacher or working in the schools, even the school district's homepages have a ton of resources for parents. And, and so I think what um, Dr. Perez was saying, it was almost like information overload, right? Especially at the beginning of the pandemic, I felt like there was so many resources. You just, as an educator, I couldn't even keep up with so many free trainings or things that I wanted to participate. So it did feel a little overwhelming. So what I would suggest there is, you know, find the topic or the information that you're really seeking out and then commit that one hour webinar or, you know, kind of commit to those things, um, you know, because it, it, it can feel a little overwhelming sometimes with too, too many things happening. And so that's what I've done is I felt like I was information overload. And then I, um, I would kind of pick and choose the ones that I wanted to participate in. Well, as we're Closing uh, up the, the hour, we will stay on beyond the hour, but uh, tell us your final thoughts and suggestions. Um, I would say, and I think Dr. Donna mentioned this before, grace. I think everyone can use a bit of grace during this time. So while um, it's, it's, and that's giving what you know necessarily deserve, right? Um, I think that grace and patience, we're living in unprecedented times and we as professionals are doing our best to, to help the individuals that we serve. Um, and sometimes offering them or giving them a bit of grace and giving us some grace too, uh, will certainly go a long way. Um, and thank you, thank you everyone for, for giving us your time. Yeah, I'll jump into, of course, I, I agree with you about giving ourselves grace, our, our educators, parents, teachers, um, and then, you know, I think alongside with the grace is remember to check in with your own mental health and those around you and, you know, taking a mental health day. That doesn't mean I have to go to the spa, but I mean, literally sometimes I'll just sit outside for a few minutes and, and just have the sun on my face. So just knowing when you need to take that break and check it in with yourself and those sort of closest to you, um, because it is really stressful and there is a lot of uncertainty um, so, so yeah, giving ourselves grace and making sure that we're sort of checking in with ourselves as well and our own sort of social emotional well-being. So, 
Thanks for coming, everybody. I was going to add, which is very similar, uh, that if there are people listening, that I would love it if they could tell themselves a compliment. Dr. Morales gave you so much information on how to shine your light on what you want to see grow for your children. And I also challenge you to, to do that inward. And I, I think it's incredible that all this is going on. It's a Friday and that there's still 379 of you that are listening to us chatter. So I'm giving you a compliment right now. This is great. We appreciate your attention. Um, and I hope that you can think about something personal for yourself and do the same thing. I know we're all like behaviorists at heart. We just can't help ourselves. And I really do hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Put it in the chat. Put your awesome comment about yourself in the chat so we can just see all of that light reflecting outward. <laughs> Um, I was going to chime in and say two different things. So the first one, I'm glad you mentioned about the chat box, because as we've talked about, Zoom fatigue is real. And in one of our staff meetings, we had actually encouraged people, instead of always putting questions, to shout out people, to put the compliments. And it's kind of carried over. So our department meetings have just had this positive air simply because of the chat. Um, but the other thing that it reminds me of, too, is just self-care and your own oxygen mask. Um, so whether you're supporting your own children and families at home, whether you're supporting a school community, your local community, your graduate students, um, we're not able to take care of each other if we don't first take care of ourselves. And I know that most of us tuning in, it means you have an interest in helping other people. But I think a lot of the times we will pile up our plates to help the others. And we often forget to save a little bit of space, hopefully the dessert room for yourself. Um, so especially as we're going into a weekend, you know, find that little bit of time to read a few pages of that book that's been waiting for you to come back to. Take your shoes off and go stand in the grass and just feel a little bit of nature. Um, I know I've personally been challenging myself to find one screen that I can turn off at some point when I'm not at work, whether it's my TV, my computer, my phone, because it's just information overload. I don't even wear my Apple Watch anymore right now because I just cannot take the constant notifications. So do what your heart needs, but just remember to take care of yourself so that you can continue to give it to others. And you know, it's interesting, I was looking at all of the chats that were coming through and there seemed to be two big buckets of ideas. One was around, you know, people really looking to make a difference. And so I encourage you guys to do research, you know, as was suggested earlier, and obviously, you know, think about some of the programs that we offer. And if any of us can provide support, please reach out. But I think the other piece that I, I'm, I'm feeling is that there were a lot of questions, it seemed from families uh, about their kids and about what do I do? And you know, we had a really limited amount of time today. So I would encourage you to reach out. You know, we have clinics here on campus that provide services on a sliding scale. Um, it's never too late to seek out services. It's never too late to get evaluations to understand what's going on with your child and to get support for your child and your family, whether it's in our clinics or in the community. Um, you know, those services are available and it's better to find out what's going on. It's really hard with a couple of words to really make sense of your individual circumstances. So, um, you know, I, I hope that you use this as an opportunity and, you know, it provides you a little bit of strength to be able to make that call, so. Well, thank you all panelists um, and thank you audience. I when I was putting this together, I really wanted to take a moment to try to see us move into, a, 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 if we could push the community a little bit into a more positive moment and, um, and really bring all these wonderful um, careers together and professions. And one of the key facts that I find is that education is no longer the traditional mindset uh, with limitations. It, uh, it, it expands all socioeconomic uh, areas and ages. And we, I've seen uh, individuals uh, walking across the graduation floor at 76 with a PhD that they dreamed of. And uh, whatever you want to do, uh, do it. Whether you choose NSU or any institution, there's many opportunities to expand yourself with certifications, degrees, advanced degrees, or finishing that bachelor's and um, 
As Dr. Valley, Valley Gray mentioned, we do have uh, clinics here at uh, in the Davie, Florida area, um, and we um, we're happy to share that with you. But uh, here at, at NSU's College of Psychology, we have bachelor's, master's, specialist, and doctoral programs that. Uh, We've got incredible faculty, as you can see, very passionate, and uh, many of them are my best friends, so I could tell you personally. Um, definitely uh, refer people to us, and my email is perez at nova.edu. We also have psychology at nova.edu. If you're not sure where to go, uh, use those, um, but definitely keep in touch.